change in, in lower animals is pretty automatic. Um, lizards change to their environment. They have very specific habits and patterns. The kind of development that you have in a lizard is different than you have in a mammal, and certainly very different when you get into the complexity of primates. And we are the most advanced primate. So it gets very, very complex in this feedback mechanism. But it is about learning, it is about adapting, and it is about growing. Endocrine disorders. I'll just go through this quickly. The hypothalamus is really the most critical. Uh, body temperature, childbirth, emotions, growth, milk production, salt and water balance, sleep, weight, appetite. These are all the factors that are associated. Hypothalamus is the key organ in the body sitting just below the uh, uh, frontal uh, lobes uh, near the uh, uh, hippocampus. It is how we perceive ourselves within our environment. It's not conscious. You, you cannot access, access it consciously. But it acts either by feedback mechanism to the frontal lobes or uh, and to the hippocampus um, or amygdala. Uh, the causes in uh, disorders include anorexia, bleeding, genetic disorders, cancer, head trauma, malnutrition, radiation, and too much surgery. Pituitary disorders. Uh, pituitary consists of two factions, anterior and posterior. Uh, the anterior portion, there is growth hormone, ACTH, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, prolactin. The posterior, oxytocin, uh, antidiuretic hormone uh, produced by and it is stored for release. Now, one of the things that I'm not looking at or, or in very little detail is reproductive medicine today because it requires its own six-hour session. So it's beyond what we do. Uh, there are a few things that I'm going to mention uh, in regard to uh, the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal uh, access, and we'll look at a few of those things. But in, but in essence, it is beyond what we could put into one day. I could, you know, we could do enteric, uh, sorry, the endocrine system. We could spend a couple of days just covering this. And you can see from the number of slides, which I kept on adding to as I went along, because I just came across something really interesting. I, I think I want to put that in there. So I get carried away. Um, so again, I would recommend that you spend some time going through these notes uh, after today, looking at them, looking and seeing what's of interest to you, and then making notes and following it up with the references. Pituitary disorders, uh, bone growth, muscle mass, body's response to stress. This is one of the most critical factors. Blood sugar, metabolic rate, uh, and uh, fertility, milk production. The hypothalamic pituitary, when you look at it, and this is not a very good illustration, but the hypothalamus sits right over the top of the uh, pituitary, and the blood circulation, the blood supply between the two of them is, is as you can see, bifurcated there. So they're getting the same blood supply. Um, and uh, these are some of the functions that's associated with the anterior and posterior uh, pituitary. The adrenals. Addison's disease, uh, mineral corticoid deficiencies, uh, Kahn syndrome, Cushing syndrome. Uh, these are some of the things. Some of these are uh, useful to know. Uh, some of them are beyond the treatment of complementary medicine, but we'll certainly look at all of those. Glucose disorders, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, gestational diabetes, mature onset of the young uh, hypoglycemia, of the young hypoglycemia. Sounds like a band, doesn't it? the young hypoglycemics. That, that did joke didn't work, did it? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, uh, hypoglycemia, idiopathic hypoglycemia, insulinemia. Thyroid disorders, and we'll look at some of those as well. Uh, thyroid symptoms, um, and this is really critical because I believe that there is a significant uh, misdiagnosis uh, in terms of thyroid disorders and I believe that there is certainly a, a considerable number of people who have uh, hypothyroidism or subclinical hypothyroidism and I think we'll look at that as we go along. Constipation, depressed mood, fatigue, skin and hair changes, parathyroid diseases, menstrual function. We'll look at a few of these as we go along. 
ovarian function. This is uh, somebody, when I was in Brisbane, asked uh, to include this. Now, for many of you, this is already something you know. Uh, but we're looking at the three different kinds of hormones here, estrone, estriol, and estradiol, and the, the way that these are produced and the relationship with that. Estrone is believed to be more carcinogenic than estradiol. Both estrogen and estradiol have vulnerable to mutation, and that's what's also critically important, the mutation of those things. All conjugated estrogens orally administered are converted to estrogen in the small bowel, because the postmenopausal women produce more estrogen than estradiol, it is more likely that this is the reason they have cancer. The, the adrenals also produce, the uh, adipose tissue produces estrogens. The ratio is really what's critically important. Uh, two metabolites, uh, two and 16, like two forms of a cholesterol, one is considered good, one is considered bad. In a person's uh, urine, we analyze the 216 ratio a ratio of 0.2 or higher seems to indicate a lower risk of getting breast cancer. A lower ratio indicates a higher chance of that. And again, that's a very useful test to make uh, for women, particularly postmenopausal, because it's then something very easy to treat. Obviously, um, uh, as you have heard me say before, and you may well know, most breast cancer happens in women over the age of 70. Uh, although most of the publicity is in younger women, because that tends to get the most sympathy. Uh, and gets the most press release, but most women, and that's a factor because it takes that long to develop breast cancer, 20 years or more. So you're looking at the beginning of this cancer at menopause, and if you can treat it and tru treat the, uh, the estradiol estrogen levels, the ratio, you can actually do something to prevent cancer. Uh, plant sources that are available to promote healthy estrogen metabolism are curcumin, um, Crisin, rosemary, uh, particularly their extract. Furthermore, many uh, antioxidants are associated with the, the conversion rate as well, phytonutrients. Um, um, vitamin C, uh, and acetylcysteine, mineral selenium, and green tea. So these are some of the things that you could use when you're working with postmenopausal women and looking at that ratio to correct that ratio. Soy supplementation increases dietary uh, in, uh, when they look at this, you get an increase in diets and glites and, and genistein, whereas there is a decrease in these other compounds. Dietary intake of genistein has been shown to favorably modulate the, uh, the, uh, the rate of 2 versus 16. Genistein is an isoflavin uh, compound obtained from plants. Now, I'm, I'm a big believer in using genistein in cancer and even in ER positive cancers. Most of the research that says it's estrogenic are done on rats where they have taken the ovaries out, so there is no estrogen activity at all. In that case, the body adapts the estrogen to be estrogenic. But in women or in rats that have not been uh, ovaritized, they do not have that effect. In fact, genistein, in, and we're talking about the correct quantity, which is usually higher than just a capsule, in that case, it actually blocks the receptor. Genistein is also very good for chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and it, it's one of the best isolates, I think, in terms of treating uh, cancers. Conjugated estrophid, um, I think that's pretty basically uh, straightforward. Mood and estrogen. This is also important. Estrogen has an impact on the mood. One of the, th again, one of the parts of the brain that has estrogen receptors is the hippocampus. And hippocampus uh, uh, can go through uh, uh, neurodegeneration. There is loss of mass because there is a lack of estrogen in the body. Uh, sudden estrogen withdrawal, fluctuating estrogen, and periods of sustained low levels of estrogen correlates to significant mood swings. Clinical recovery from postpartum, perimenopausal, and postmenopausal depression is shown to be effective after the level of estrogens have been stabilized. There's a complex 